I have something for our, our host here, and this is the bumper sticker that says, My Other Vehicle Zaps Rocks on Mars. There you are. Oh, very good. <laughs> Every taxpayer ought to have one of those. Now, the only question is, is that as someone who works at NASA, Marshall and Huntsville, am I allowed to, to, I don't know if I can put this on my vehicle and drive around, uh, you know, see how this is probably made in Pasadena. <laughs> <laughs> inside, well, just, inside NASA joke. You'll just have to take that risk. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon, and it has been a fantastic year on Mars. Uh, never before have we been in this kind of terrain and seen these kinds of things on Mars, and never before have we had this kind of instrumentation on Mars, and so it is just a fantastic time. But I want to I want to mention that this is, a, of course, a huge community that is involved in doing this. And uh, this is just one page out of our Mars calendar, which, yes, takes 27 months for one, or 20, I'm sorry, 22 months for one Mars year. And this is the credits for our ChemCam instrument. Um, but I think there might be some people in the audience who have worked on the Curiosity overall. So if there's any, if, I, know, I know there's some, so go ahead and stand up if you've worked on Curiosity in some capacity or other. All right. Thanks. So just to um, start us off, the goals of the Curiosity rover are these four, uh, basically to assess Mars' biological potential by searching for organic compounds, for biological clues and chemical building blocks of life. And then, of course, we want to characterize the geology of the landing region, investigate Mars for habitability. And that habitability is really important to the top bullet of, of looking for organics because, of course, if you have a habitable place, then you can really truly look for the uh, biological potential. And then finally, we want to characterize the human hazards looking forward in the next few decades to human, humans going to Mars. And uh, I might remind you that the Mars biological potential has not really been studied in a strong way with a lander or rover uh, since Viking. And so it was high time that we come back to st looking at carbon compounds and and these types of, 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 of details. Um, Phoenix had some with their wet chemistry experiment, but it was not really, really in-depth uh, studied since the 1970s. But um, here is the progression of the rovers, just to remind you. This was 1997, and we had a little 23-pound rover called Sojourner that was wildly successful in terms of the fact that it actually landed and was able to rove on Mars. But, um, of course, it was tiny. So that um, prompted um, the, uh, Curio uh, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, which were launched in 2003 and landed successfully in 2004. Uh, one of them made a hole in one in, uh, in this tiny little eagle, eagle crater, and uh, it was great fun to watch these. Um, but, and one of them is still going today, so uh, Opportunity is still running, even though it had a 90-day life, supposedly. Um, but uh, with the 11 pounds of equipment on these two rovers, uh, on each of these two rovers, the science uh, community was really dreaming for the day when we could fly a whole mobile laboratory. 11 pounds just didn't cut it. And so the dream was to have more than 150 pounds of payload that we could really do a lot, just like we could do in a chemistry and, and geochemistry laboratory on Earth. And we got our wish. This was our, this was our dream machine. And uh, so here it is, one ton, um, the arm from the shoulder joint on down, if I can run this laser, um, weighs about as much as one of these whole rovers. And the instrumentation adds up to more than 160 pounds of payload. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a real dream machine. It doesn't roll very fast, as you'll hear later, but it sure does handle uh, equipment on the inside. Um, so here's a little closer up image. Uh, artist conception showing the different elements of the payload. And when you construct a rover, especially looking for certain things like the biological potential and the habitability, uh, you have to do this in a, in a, in a certain way. Um, notably, you have to have instruments that will make quick and dirty measurements and survey the area around the rover and then get you to making the most um, intense or, or useful measurements on just the samples that are, that are, that are the, most, uh, the most interesting. If you spend all of your time measuring one sample, you're, not, you're never going to get to the other samples. 
So uh, it's set up with an architecture where you have remote sensing instruments that, are, that do the, uh, if, you'll ex if, if Chem Cam will excuse my saying, quick and dirty measurements. Uh, along with mast cam, and then that can feed forward into the contact measurements that are made with the instruments on the arm. And, and so those include APXS, which is now on its third generation of rover, and it, can, and it, and it includes the, um, the MOLLE um, imager. And uh, just for those of you that don't know, uh, uh, Curiosity is like a, like a teenager with, a, you know, with, with, with an iPad iPod, and so it just can take this camera on the end of its arm and turn it around and take a selfie, right? So you'll see that, uh, you saw it on the title page and so on. Um, and uh, then we have uh, those feed forward into the in situ instruments, and these are the big workhorses, the mobile laboratory instruments. Um, and so SAM stands for Sample Analysis on Mars. It's the Goddard Space Flight Center instrument that does um, uh, it does pyrolysis, it does oxidation, and it does wet chemistry, and it also makes atmospheric measurements, and it does isotope ratios, and it does gas chromatograph measurements on these. And so it's an amazing instrument in, in all in its own. And then a chem-in is the JPL instrument that does definitive um, mineralogy on these samples. And both of these instruments work uh, only when they get a sample, uh, with the exception of SAM's atmospheric measurements, only when they get a sample from the arm, uh, this arm uh, practically slices and dices the Mars rocks. Uh, it has a scoop and a drill, and the drill tailings or the scoop uh, material uh, goes through a uh, sieve. It goes through something called a thwacker to get it through that sieve, and then it gets portioned into the right amounts, and then that gets dumped into um, funnels uh, on, the, on, on the top of the rover up here. And uh, uh, then we have some other instruments, and those are REMS, Dan, uh, Rad, and, and Marty. Uh, REMS is a weather station. Dan is looking for hydrogen or broad swath underneath the rover, as in clay minerals or even possible water ice. Um, and then Rad looks for the radiation environment. And Marty does, uh, did the descent imaging as this rover came down. And so you'll see that video a little bit later. Um, and it's the first time we had a descent video right to the surface of Mars. Now the other thing about this payload is that it's very international. And so half of my instrument, ChemCam, is French. Um, they might say the better half because they built the laser. Um, and uh, REMS is Spanish, Dan is Russian, um, ha uh, the gas chromatograph is French from SAM, um, let's see, APXS is Canadian, and half of RAD is German. And so it's a very international team, and we've, uh, we've had a great time together. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how ChemCam works. ChemCam is both uh, the highest resolution remote imager on the rover, but it's, uh, it's in uh, black and white so that uh, we don't really take the limelight away from the mast cameras. And then we also have this technique called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that, but in a nutshell, what we tell the public is that we take a laser and uh, we, we focus it onto a target up to about 20, 23 feet away. And uh, so we can tell the public that we, sh we uh, uh, basically, we, sh we take the energy of a million light bulbs, we, we put it on a spot the size of a pinhead for five billionths of a second. And with that, we produce these plasmas, and here you can see uh, different plasmas uh, from different materials. And we tell the public that the, that the color of the plasma is what tells us the composition of the rock. And, uh, and so that's, uh, of course, done with the spectrograph, and uh, a lot of you in optics know a lot more about that, as we'll talk about in just a minute. So um, the advantages of LIBS are that we don't have to prepare samples. We can do this very rapidly. Each laser shot gives us a spectrum, and so we now have more than 80,000 spectra from the surface of Mars. Um, this operates at a distance. Uh, we remove dust from surfaces, and that's really important potentially for a place like Mars. And so a little pebble like this, uh, which looked featureless before, after we've shot it, you can start to see uh, some of the uh, different uh, shadings coming out, which we, we didn't see when the dust was on it, for example. Um, the LIBS technique provides depth profiles into about half a millimeter or so into the rock, or up to about five centimeters into a soil, um, with repeated laser pulses in the same place. This can be important for studying the, the uh, weathering surfaces on rocks or if they have some kind of a coating or rind on them. 
And then uh, LIBS detects nearly all elements, including the light elements. And uh, um, we have very low detection limits for some of the elements. And then we have fine spatial resolution that I'll show you in just a bit. So we came up with an instrument that has a schematic that looks like this. Uh, there are two different parts to it. Um, it actually breaks down very nicely into the French part that's up on the mast. And uh, I guess true to form, the French got the sexier position, like I said. But, uh, um, uh, and then we at Los Alamos built the body unit, which has the detectors in it. So uh, just to go into a little more detail, the laser um, gives us 14 millijoules on the target. But it actually, uh, you'll see in just a minute, it gives us uh, 35 millijoules uh, total. Um, it's Q-switched. It's at 1067 nanometers, which is like a neodymium YAG, but with a KGW crystal, it's more thermally accommodating. And uh, then um, be besides the laser and telescope, we have our imager up there as well. But the light that the telescope collects goes down a fiber, optical fiber, six meters long, and into the body of the rover. And there we have the spectrometers and, uh, and also the data processing units. So um, I'm not going to show you um, a, a, the insides of the spectrometers, because we really went with the rule that said, keep it simple. And we were just flying three Cerny Turner uh, spectrometers that are fed by these optical fibers. And there's not really too much complicated to them, um, except for the CCDs. And, that's, uh, and we have the CCD producer here in the audience. So we're very grateful for that. Um, but the mast unit uh, looks like th this in terms of its optics. And so the laser sits uh, right here at a right angle to the telescope. The light from the laser um, comes out and is expanded through a Galilean telescope just to give its beam a little bit a larger diameter. It then gets dumped into this schmidt cassegrain telescope that's 110 millimeters aperture. And uh, from there, uh, it's sent out to the sample. Uh, we see the plasma. And then we use the same telescope to, uh, to receive the, the plasma light. And that light goes through the same dichroic, or through this dichroic in the middle of the, of the primary mirror of the Sch schmidt cassegrain And then it gets um, sent to either the camera or to the, um, or to the optical fiber receptacle there. And then it goes down to the body. So I'm going to show you just this short video that shows, um, first of all, the operations concept on Mars, which is completely simple. You the mast points us at a rock. We focus, and we shoot the laser and, and get this light. Um, and, then we'll get, and then we'll show you what the instrument looks like in a little demonstration. Uh, but first, oh, I forgot about the laser. The laser is um, shown here, and it's, uh, it's a, a half a kilogram. It's, it's fairly simple. It's got a, the oscillator, and then it also has just one amplifier stage. And, um, uh, we used KGW as a crystal because of the thermal accommodation, and so this is passively cooled. And uh, typically, the mast up on top of the rover is, sits at minus 40 degrees C in the cold Mars environment. And then when we want to operate this, we'll warm the laser up to minus 10. And then at that temperature, it operates optimally and gives us the 35 millijoules out of the laser. So here's our video. First of all, just point and shoot on Mars. And then I'll show you uh, what the instrument looks like. And so here's the body unit sitting on top of a vibration table. And we just have the electronics boards in the bottom in a magnesium uh, casing. And then here are the spectrometers and a beryllium housing here. There's three of them side by side. This is the mask unit. And so the laser is right off on the side, the cylindrical object. And uh, this is the telescope. It is the biggest optic, uh, optical device on the surface of Mars. And uh, um, so we do have to protect it from the sunlight shining in to this telescope. We're going to give a demonstration here, shooting at a nice big iron pyrite crystal. It's about eight feet away. There you can see it. And you won't see the, the, the laser light, which of course is in infrared, but you'll see these little flashes. And so there you go. And that's what it looks like. Um, and we'll show that one more time. And here's a still image. So it's really optically bright. And uh, that's great. Now, the media loves this particular instrument because of the uh, sexiness of having a, this big laser on Mars. And so we tell them we're zapping rocks on Mars. And then the media goes out and says, you know, they like to make it bigger. So they say, well, well you know, ChemCam will blast rocks on Mars. And so the public doesn't really know exactly what to expect. And so shortly after we did our first libs on Mars, we saw this picture on the internet. And we had to promise people, we really don't do this kind of environmental damage on Mars. 
But in fact, we really do get better plasmas on Mars. This is just like the plasma you just saw. It's in a terrestrial atmosphere. But if we take a chamber and we pump it down to Mars pressure, which is 1% of the Earth's atmospheric pressure, it looks like this. And so it's, uh, it expands better, and we get a little brighter, a uh, little, little bit more luminosity out of it. And in fact, just this week uh, in the uh, JPL t um, VSTB, uh, they're going to do a run where, we can, where we're going to set up to try to image this on Mars, which we haven't done yet. So uh, hopefully we'll get an image like this that's a bona fide uh, plasma picture from, from Mars. OK, so this is what we look, look at um, for, uh, this is our very first spectrum that we got on the surface of Mars. It was almost exactly a year ago. And, um, and so we shot at a rock called Coronation that was uh, just about three meters away. And this is the spectrum that we got. And remember, we have three spectrometers. So we're showing the ultraviolet, the sort of a violet range here, and in the visible and near infrared range. And um, what you can see is that we have, we have hundreds, many hundreds of emission lines. So the, the spectrum is really rich in information. And you can see that we uh, have the atomic emission lines from, from all of the major elements and some of the minor and trace elements as well. Um, and here I, 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 uh, we're highlighting the hydrogen peak because we, we discovered something really interesting. The very first shot that we shoot, um, First of all, this is an average spectrum of, of the 50 shots we did on this rock just in one place. But this is uh, all of these spectra shown separately in this little inset. And the very first spectrum that we get on every single rock has a big peak of hydrogen. Why do you think that is? It's the dust that's sitting on top of the rock, right? And we blow it off on the first shot. And so the dust on Mars is hydrated. And we didn't know that before. So a very, little, very interesting thing that we, we got out of our very first shot on Mars and um, so that's confirmed. The Mars Odyssey um, uh, orbiter from since 2001 has shown us the near-surface hydrogen on Mars. And uh, it's been a lot of speculation. Is this in clay minerals? Is it in what? Well, it turns out that a good fraction of this can be attributed to the dust and the soil on Mars. So um, I'm going to take you through the landing that uh, the, the, the uh, Curiosity rover underwent on Mars. And uh, this is just absolutely a fabulous feat of, of, uh, of engineering. And we're, we're so thankful to JPL and the engineers um, who did this and all those who, who participated. But um, of course, first came the selection of the landing site. And in, in, by late 2008, we had, the, we had four candidate landing sites. Um, and they were all ones to die for. I mean, they were just great. One of them had the best clay mineral signature from orbit. One of them looked like this, and uh, so it looked like a, um, the largest river delta in the solar system outside of the Earth. And I mean, just look at this. It's got, it's got these little, um, um, uh, it's got these fingers going out here and the little bends that, like you'd expect in a river at the end of the Mississippi River Delta and so on. Um, and so if you were to expect uh, to look for organics or biosignatures, you might expect to do that in a place where that's concentrated with nutrients. And that would be at the end of a river, right? And so this was one of our top sites. Um, but we didn't see a lot of clay mineral signature there. And so there's argument, how long was this in place and all of that. And we ended up going to a different place altogether. And it's this place that says Curiosity, of course. And um, so that is Gale Crater. And you might ask, why would we go to some place that, looks e that, that, uh, uh, that, that might possibly top that river delta? Um, but Gale Crater has a number of things going for it, and I, we did not go wrong in our decision. Um, this is, sits on the boundary between the, the southern highlands and the northern lowlands. Um, you can see a channel coming in at the southern, southern end of this crater. And, um, and so it's likely that this, that this lower part of this crater was filled in with, with water at some time. But how many of you remember where the Spirit rover landed in 2004? It was a place called Gusev Crater, and they were expecting the same thing. They, they saw a channel going in, flowing in from the south, and this, this huge crater is much bigger than this even. And uh, so they landed spirit there. Well, it turned out that after the, after the lacustrine environment, it was all filled with lava. And so there were some, some detractors that were saying that might be the case here as well. Um, the other reason that we went to Gale Crater was not just the, uh, the lake aspect, but it was this. It was, it was uh, this feature in the middle of the crater called Mount Sharp. 
and Mount Sharp is five kilometers high, and from orbit it looks like it was sedimentary material. And if you're a geologist, if you were to come any place on the Earth to look for the climate history um, and potential habitability, you might go to the Grand Canyon where you can find all of these rock layers. And that's what we're hoping to find and what we will find and what we're seeing already in Mount Sharp is layer upon layer upon layer um, of, of rock that was emplaced in a sedimentary way. And so we're, we're, uh, this is really the destination of, the, of our mission is Mount Sharp. Okay, but first of all, we had to get there. And uh, so in, in 2003 and early, two, uh, in early 2004, the engineers at JPL were looking at how they would land a 900 kilogram rover. And uh, they said, well, we're, we're not gonna be able to land it the same way we did Spirit and Opportunity, which was on airbags. You take something that's uh, as heavy as your car and you try to drop it on an airbag. I don't care if the, if the gravity is only as strong as, as it is on Mars, 38% on Earth. You're gonna, you're gonna bust that vehicle. And uh, so um, the engineers had two choices. They could either take a retro rocket package and land the rover on top of it on a platform, or they could put the retro rocket package on top of the rover. And uh, they chose actually the latter because driving a rover off of a tall platform has a lot of risks in its own. And this way they could actually land the rover on its own wheels and this is a high clearance vehicle, so if there were some rocks there, it would not matter, whereas if you had a platform, it might end up really crooked. Um, and so uh, that meant the retro rocket package would go on top of it, and the best way they had to get rid of that was to lower the rover on cables and then cut the cables and this retro rocket package could fly off. And we just said, you're kidding. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think I was much more paranoid than most people I had just been coming off of another mission, you can read about it in this book, but uh, it was called the Genesis mission, and it was the first mission to, to come back to the Earth robotically from beyond the orbit of the moon. And this was 2004, and this was my previous NASA landing experience, and it looked like this. And if, if, if a simple landing that just required a parachute and an accelerometer and a timer uh, looked like this on the Earth, what would it look like on Mars when you had 76 different pyrotechnic devices that all had to go off just right, and, uh, and was I going to expect that to land safely? Well, I guess I didn't have any choice. So um, what I'm going to do is show you the landing sequence as it's supposed to look like, but remember we had an animation like this uh, for the Genesis mission as well, but just because the animation looked good didn't mean the landing succeeded. Um, and uh, then after this animation, we can show you now the descent image from the MARTI camera, and so not only do we see it as it was supposed to look, but we actually see it as it looked from the rover as it was coming down. So as soon as the heat shield came off, the rover, off of the capsule, you can start to see the, the surface of Mars. And that's synced up with the voices from the control room at JPL. Remember, the control room is a misnomer here because they were not in control. They had uh, sent the command, do EDL, entry, descent, and landing about two days ago, and they were just watching at this point. So, uh, but they really did seem confident. Um, so um, let me see if I can get this to go here. There we go. And so this is just leaving Earth. There was an eight and a half month um, travel time. We might want to dim the lights just a little more for this. Um, and so uh, there goes the cruise stage, and it's starting the entry. Uh, this is the first mission to use guided entry by NASA, and so you, you will start to see these jets that are actually steering the capsule as it's coming through the atmosphere there, and that allowed it to land within about a, two kilometers of where we were expecting it. In fact, they knew almost exactly where it was gonna land. And there goes a supersonic parachute, um, and it's still going to be plummeting to the ground because of the uh, thin atmosphere of Mars. There it goes. And then here comes the EDL. Whoa! And uh, this is when it got really scary for us. And uh, so this is, uh, and then of course at the last minute, the wheels snap into place or else you would just have a dumb lander instead of a rover. But there it goes. And then um, the computer is actually on board the rover. So once the cable is cut, that thing just flies off and crashes. And that's where, we, that's where it goes. And uh, so now we're going to actually see the real thing. And uh, I think you're all aware this was called the seven minutes of terror. We're cutting it down a little bit in time for the video. But uh, here it goes. 
So the dark part is a sand dune, a big line of sand dunes. And uh, the rover is going to land just a little bit to the um, uh, north uh, east of the sand dunes, right about, I think, over there. And okay, here we're cutting to the powered flight. So the sky crane had to do a divert maneuver to actually avoid the parachute that was still plummeting down. And then after it diverts, then it starts to straighten out. And as it gets down to a, a just a, a less than 100 meters above the surface, it's going to start kicking up the dust. And uh, in this image, you'll see the wheel deploy right about there in just a few seconds. There comes the dust. And there comes a wheel, successful wheel deployment. And as, as this goes down to the ground, the rover's shadow is going to make this really dark. I don't know if we can darken the room a little bit. But uh, right about there it lands. And everyone's getting excited, but they, they're, they were told to wait a little bit, I think, before they actually declared success. So you can see the ground right there in that sunlight. There we go. So, so that was a two and a half billion dollar gamble, and we were so thankful that our pair, uh, that our payload survived. Um, it was so much so much sweeter than the previous landing I had experienced. And uh, so this is the pictures that we started to get out of the, out of the rover. And uh, so you can see Mount Sharp in the distance. But in the foreground, I don't know if you can see it there, but as we started to, to look at these images carefully, we started to see rounded pebbles in, this, in the foreground. Do you know what rounded pebbles meant to us? It meant that the, that the gravel that you're seeing here had been in a flowing stream for some amount of time, long enough to tumble these rocks until they were rounded. And that was something we had never before seen anywhere on Mars. And so we knew right away this was a very special place. And within about a month of landing and of starting to drive, this was what we came up with. It may look like a broken up uh, driveway, but to a geologist, this is sweet. This is, um, this is conglomerate. And so you can see uh, that there are rocks weathering out and is falling into this little pile here. And uh, these are produced, conglomerates are produced in riverbeds. And it's natural cement. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's exactly what we were looking for because it said there was, there was water flowing here abundantly sometime several billion years in the past. Um, now stepping back right to the landing site, we also uncovered a little conglomerate area with the thruster right there. But right next to that, to that uh, outcrop there, uh, for example, you could see this little rock. And if we, t if we look at the image of the RMI, which is the ChemCam imager, uh, you can start to see that we're seeing some really interesting mineral, very coarse mineral grains there. We had not seen something like that before on Mars. And so this was a, a clue that something was coming up. And as we started to go down the traverse, um, this is, uh, this is where we went from the landing site, which is darkened from the dust that was blown away. And we started heading east um, to this uh, area called uh, Yellowknife Bay. And as we got along on this uh, traverse, this is what the compositions looked like just in one element from ChemCam. So this is a silicon. And we started seeing these high silicon values, which uh, were, had not been seen before like this. And so that also intrigued us. Some people said, nah, we don't believe your instrument. But uh, then they started to see uh, pictures like this. And here we see large, what we're sure now is large feldspar, large alkali feldspar mineral grains. This is not something we've seen before on Mars. And so what this told us is that the, the, um, the igneous petrology of Mars is actually a lot more diverse than we'd realized before. And so there's a story to be told there. This is mostly a sedimentary geology mission and, and of course, uh, looking for organics. But the igneous petrologists really started to sit up and, and pay attention at this point. Um, so uh, the APXS instrument on the arm was, uh, got to be deployed about Sol or day 45. 
and they did on this pyramid-looking rock cult that we named Jake Mateevich after one of the uh, Murr uh, engineers. And um, this is a alkali versus silicon plot, and the, the open points here are ocean island basalt compositions from the Earth. And uh, most of the previous Mars rocks had, had been measured and, and, and plot about down there. But um, Jake plotted way up here. And so it's clear that we are getting some quite unique igneous rocks on Mars. And so th our big question now is where did, you know, this is a f what we call a float rock. It's not part of the bedrock there. Where did it come from? How abundant are these in this region on Mars? And, and maybe why did we miss them from orbit? And that's, uh, that's very intriguing. Um, and uh, then after uh, hitting Jake, then we went uh, out of the gravel uh, area of the Bradbury Landing Site and started seeing our first bedrocks over here, first at Bathurst Inlet and then Rock Nest. And as we, um, if I look at the ChemCam data from this area and just plot it here in, um, in a type of geochemistry plot that, sh that gives us um, the potentially different minerals, the Jake composition is plot right about here uh, by APXS. But looking at all the ChemCam data, uh, we get a plot like this in the Bradbury area and in this in the uh, Rock Nest area. And so what it looked like was that we were getting um, sort of Bradbury Rise area with an addition of probably an iron cement. And uh, so we're able to interpret that seeing all of this different uh, data that we get out of, out of ChemCam with its many analyses. This is uh, how it looks when we actually shoot ChemCam at a soil. And so this is uh, using our uh, RMI imager. And uh, we're shooting at a little bit of a slope. So you'll see all the dust grains are falling down to the lower part of the picture. And uh, it almost looks like the, uh, like the, uh, the hole walks upwards on the, on the picture. And it's a time lapse that we did, taking images before and after uh, the laser shots. So you're not actually seeing the, the nice bright plasma in these. Um, but if we look at the analysis of these, uh, remember we said that there's hydrogen in, the, in this dust and soil, so the fine grain dust has the hydrogen in it, but we can also see coarse grains in the soil, which is actually the rocks in this area that are breaking down and becoming part of the soil. This had never been seen before, so this is, this is uh, also a, a first discovery. Um, now, as, as we left Rock Nest, we started heading into this area called Yellowknife Bay. And uh, this was not supposed to have bedrock, but it does. And in fact, this is, looks like very soft bedrock. And um, uh, one of the first things we saw as we, as we went into there is that there's lots of veins, these white veins. And so using ChemCam, we were able to shoot at those veins and just show that we have uh, sulfur and calcium and some hydrogen. And so this is reminiscent of gypsum or analogs of gypsum like anhydrite. One of my New Mexico colleagues quipped, that Mars looks a lot like New Mexico, only more so. And I think he's right. Um, and you'll see more in a little bit. But um, as, uh, just to point out some of the, ac uh, some of the ways we can use ChemCam, um, it's a really fine point uh, sort of microprobe that we can use from the top of the mast of the rover. And so here are the two, first two holes that were drilled by the rover, by the rover's arm. And they're about uh, eight feet away. And if we do a blow up of that, it looks like this. You can see that we shot through the tailings here, but we didn't just shoot through the tailings. We actually shot up the side of that hole. And just to uh, give you an idea, that hole is the size of a dime. So that's, uh, that's how big it is. So it would be like taking this dime in my hand here and throwing it out over there and then saying, we're going to shoot up, the hair, up and down the hairline of, of our friend, Mr. Roosevelt. Um, that's how accurately we can point this thing. And so that is uh, a really great microprobe technique. Um, OK, going back to some more of the drill results, these are just some, ni some more nice pictures. But the 20% uh, of the material that went into the ChemMin instrument turned out to be clay minerals. And so that, uh, by studying these clay minerals, we could tell that the water that these were laid down in had a normal or neutral pH. And so what we had in Gale Crater was a freshwater lake didn't have any fish in it, apparently, but you could have taken a glass and drank the water. And so we succeeded in finding a habitable place on Mars like never before. 
Now, in terms of the organics and the atmosphere, um, the SAM instrument looked for methane. We, they did not detect any, and their de detection limit was about two parts per billion. You'd expect methane if there were living organisms uh, that were producing methane, of course. And um, they also did not find organic molecules indicative of the type of life uh, that we have on Earth. So uh, that has not been found yet. But I want to remind people that if you're going to look for life that existed three and a half billion years ago, which is what we're looking for, it's hard to do on Earth as well. So uh, um, now, uh, of course, these forms of life are more recent, but they're looking for life uh, in the form of stromatolites in this uh, very ancient outcrop in Australia. And that's a tough thing to do. So the search is going to go on. Um, now, this is where the rover is now. Uh, we, we looked earlier at the Bradbury landing site and the fact that we went east. Um, but now we've driven about a mile and a half total. And we're just off of this picture. This was uh, near the weekend, uh, Sol 374. And we're on our way towards Mount Sharp, as I pointed out earlier, the, the goal of our mission. And so this is what the orbital picture looks like. Um, Glen Elg is synonymous with Yellowknife Bay, uh, and so that's where we were. Right now, we're just approaching the, the sort of the arrow tip of that first arrow, so we're almost one-fifth of the way towards the sort of gateway to the mountain. And uh, so it's, it's a long trek. This rover actually drives about a tenth of a mile an hour, so this is not a, this is not a speed demon, but, um, but it really has the equipment on it, so that's what we're glad for. Um, this is what it looks like from long range. And so just as we were promised from orbit, uh, it looks like we have a lot of rock layers there. And um, this is, uh, if you can imagine the rover going up one of these canyons, the scenery is going to be absolutely spectacular. And I think I have one more picture um, somewhere here um, that just uh, shows, anyway, this, is, this could be Moab, Utah, or some other place. It's just amazing uh, terrain. And the reason we're going towards the edge of Mount Sharp, there's um, clay mineral signatures we're seeing from orbit there. There's a hematite strip. And so there's a lot of terrain that we think is going to be absolutely fascinating. So um, this is just a summary of what ChemCam has done. Uh, this shows the number of laser shots as a function of our first year. And so we're up over 80,000 laser shots. Each one of them has returned to spectrum. And we've got over 1,000 images from ChemCam as well. And so it's been a very versatile, uh, exciting instrument to be a, a part of, let alone to lead. And uh, I'm going to leave you there because this mission isn't over yet. Um, but uh, stay tuned for the next couple of years when we get to Mount Sharp and we start really doing what we were going to do there. Thank you.